Hi, welcome back to another episode of Minds Behind Maps. I'm Maxim Lunderman, and this is the latest episode in this experiment I'm trying, where I want to sit down with people who are creating and using anything geospatial to try to understand more about the field and the people in it. Today's guest is Bruno Sanchez, who currently works as the program director of the planetary computer at Microsoft. Bruno has also written a book called Impact Science, The Science of Getting to Radical Social and Environmental Breakthroughs, which we talk about in length throughout this episode. I actually didn't know that Bruno had written a book when I first reached out to him about the podcast. He wrote the book under Creative Commons licensing and was kind enough to send me a copy of the book ahead of our conversation. As will become quite apparent during the episode, I really enjoyed reading this book. I think it's a great read for people like myself, and I'm guessing that if you're listening to this, you might be in the same situation. We work with data to try to solve problems, but sometimes we might get a little bit too dogmatic about the data itself and tend to forget about the problem we're trying to solve. I think this is something that does happen quite often within the field of data science, and I'm definitely guilty of that. Bruno's book is a sort of guide for people trying to solve problems, still while leveraging data, but also through understanding that data alone cannot solve problems. I feel like I've heard this mentioned multiple times before, but this book and some of this conversation, I hope, takes the time to explain this a little bit more in detail and how it occurs, but also how data scientists like myself or anyone wanting to have an impact can actually think about impact. I don't think this is an end in itself, but I do think it's a quite a refreshing and important message to hear. I can recommend giving Bruno's book a read. It's on Amazon if you want a copy. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. However, as Bruno mentioned in this episode, you can reach to him, or myself actually, and we'll provide you with a free copy. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to Bruno was also to hear his journey and thoughts about being and then leaving academia. It's something that comes up in his book, and he mentions how it was not necessarily an easy process. I haven't spent that much time in academia, and I don't know that much about it. I've been mostly exposed to people within the industry. So I wanted to know more about the thought process that took him to first go and then leave academia. This actually led us to discuss about things like education, how people learn, and how we teach skills and knowledge to people. One of the things I find interesting about data science and the field of geospatial is how many people come to it from different routes. Education ends up being an important pillar in people's journey, and Bruno had some very interesting thoughts about the topic. We also, of course, talk about Bruno's work at Microsoft, and more globally what his team is doing with the planetary computer, how they're trying to lower the barrier to entry to geospatial. At the time this podcast goes out, the planetary computer still requires requesting access. I've been able to play around with it a little bit, and if you're interested, I would definitely encourage you to at least take a look at it. To be honest, I find talking about how big companies like Microsoft are taking a crack at problems such as lowering the barrier to entry to geodata a difficult topic to approach. I want to approach these topics with a healthy dose of skepticism while also having an open mind and seeing the value that these projects can bring, because they clearly seem to be bringing some sort of value. This is why I want to have these conversations. I want these to be a way to take the time to understand these initiatives a bit more in detail and what they're trying to achieve. I'm really thankful that Bruno came on the podcast to talk about his work, and I hope this brings insightful elements to the conversations that I think need to happen. Finally, as always, if you want to reach out to me, please feel free to do that either on Twitter, that's where I'm most active and probably spend a bit too much time. I'm at Max Lennerman there, and I also have an account for the podcast, that's at Minds Behind Maps. You can also reach to me by email if that's your thing. I'll put that in the show notes. I do want to know what you think about this if you want to share some thoughts. With all of that said, here is my conversation with Bruno Sanchez. Hi Bruno, uh, welcome to Minds Behind Maps. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. Um, so I'm going to start it off like I start all of these ones. Um, I'd like to um, ask if you could uh, describe yourself to me. Well, first of all, um, hello. Good morning, Maxim. Uh, uh, good morning for me, for you. Is at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Seattle, and you are in Amsterdam, right? Yeah, in uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah, in the Hague. In actually. the Netherlands. Oh yeah, in the Hague. We talked about it when we were preparing for the interview. Mm -hmm. So how would I describe myself? Um, I'm a scientist trying to figure out 
what is the best way for science to have an impact in society? That has mm. been my professional driver or my moral compass, professional moral compass. Besides that, I'm a new dad. Three months ago, uh, we had a baby. So I'm learning also <laughs> to, to this new identity that has uh, just started. I'm a, I'm a husband. I have a wife since two years ago. Um, I'm a citizen of the world. Um, I guess you had to specify, I would say European. I feel European, even though I am now living in the US. And yeah, a curious man, tried, curious mind trying to understand the world. All right, I, I love this answer. Uh, this is, this is it's, it's so broad. Um, yeah, so you're a, you're a scientist focusing on, on impact. Um, I think one of the interesting things to, to learn about um, as I was preparing this was um, your background, was the, the whole process you've gone through. Um, you wrote a book, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, and you describe a lot of that. Um, so one, one of the things that comes up a lot is, is this notion of, of trying to have impact for, for a scientist. So we'll, we'll go back to the, the whole process, but I, I'd like to start by where you are today. Do you feel like you've managed to, to get to where you are to become the impact scientist that, that you talk a lot about in, in the book? I don't, I don't think so. I think we're always a work in progress. I think we're always evolving. And I didn't, I didn't want to be or to have the job I have now when I started mm. this process. And maybe in the future, I would consider this just a stepping stone, or maybe I will stay where I am now for many years. I don't know. But I think it's, it's worth recognizing that it's not really a destination. It's more a, yeah. a, a, a journey. And what I'm sure is that I... I have much more confidence of what I'm doing that it makes sense because for many years, I even um, questioned if what I was trying to do was actually a thing or just mm, a crazy idea. The, the fact that scientists do have a role outside of academia and there's a thing called science outside of academia. I, for right. many years, I didn't know that was even possible, but at least now I know much more and in that sense, I feel I've arrived to some space, but it's not really, a, um, I don't think I've, I've made it in that sense. I don't think no one makes it. One thing is, if one thing is constant is that there's change, always change, yeah. right? So who knows what the future holds? Right. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. So with that, let's, let's go back to um, how you're, you, you started. You're from, from Spain if I uh, understood correctly. So- I'm from, from a very small village in the middle of, uh, in Asturias, which is in the middle of the North Coast. Okay. And so you, you started uh, going towards astrophysics at the beginning of um, your, your career, basically. Um, mm -hmm. I, what I'm very interested in is learning kind of how that went to be. How did you uh, decide to go towards that? What led you to do that? What led you, into academia in the first place? Because you talk a lot about leaving it in, in your book. And I'm very curious what led you inside, what was um, attracting you uh, towards academia in the first place? Yeah, so by the way, you, you mentioned the book, thank you for mentioning that book. I, I brought it as the book I wish I had read when I was uh, starting this journey. Mm -hmm. So if any of your readers wants to have the book it's of course it's available in amazon if they want to buy it but also just send sending you or me an email i'm happy to send anyone the text of the book it's licensed creative commons so anyone can do whatever they want with it <laughs> yeah that's great thanks for sending it by the way i I'd, I'd like to actually uh, talk a little bit about the whole process of yeah uh, of writing that book yeah but what to your question of mm -hmm. i i don't know when it started, but I always wanted to be uh, a scientist and as, right. an astronomer. Um, even before I knew how to read, I remember my mom <laughs> tells me that I, I saw a poster of a astrophysical conference walking back home from the playground and I wanted to go there. And then my mom had to, was struggling to figure out how to buy a book of astro about astronomy for kids that don't yet know how to read. So mm. it comes from it comes from very early this 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 passion on astronomy. But it was astronomy, and I was a curious mind. What 
I didn't realize is that society then told me, hey, if you are curious and you want to be a scientist, you have to go to academia. I didn't right. choose to go to academia. I chose to go to study physics and then astrophysics. And the continuation of that path, I was led to believe is 100% continue to do a postdoc and then um, professor or drop and do something else. That was, that was why I got into it. Right. I did do the postdoc, but then I left. So if I understand correctly, like what you're saying is that that's kind of back then when you were, um, I don't know, after um, high school, I'm guessing, and, and yeah. just you're realizing, okay, if I want to pursue this, the only way to go towards that is, is just towards academia. That, that's... It was, at, the, at that time, it was not that the only way was academia. That was the way. Uh, right. Okay. I was, I loved physics. Mm. I loved astronomy. I love understanding things. Um, I had a, and I still have, and I hope I will always have this um, intellectual promiscuity. <laughs> I'm intellectually promiscuous to everything I hear. I, I want to understand mm -hmm. how the thing works. So for me, it was not a, it was not even a question what to do. It was physics, and I loved physics, and then astrophysics, and I, the more I did it, the more I liked it. So then did my PhD in solar physics, and that's when that kind of was the the end of the, the normative path. Like if you want to do science, well, there's a few options, physics, chemistry, or a few others, mm -hmm. right? And chose physics. And then if you want to continue, you university and then specialization, astrophysics, it was my choice. And then if you want to continue, that's the PhD. And then if you want to continue, that was basically, a, that is basically when it starts to be more messy and, and harder, not because it's intrinsically hard, right? like research, but also harder because you need to find your 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 life path your your work your professional um, identity right so is that when that started kind of thinking in in your head about is that is that really what you want to do when it starts becoming mm -hmm. like you yeah. said messy and, and harder to decide your your life path yeah and it was i don't want i don't want to sound and i hope the book doesn't do it either i want to sound uh, optimistic and positive mm -hmm. but there is a big factor of rejection in this process in the okay. sense that i was i was pushed towards a postdoc or everything else and this everything else was an option b it was if you are not good enough then you do the option b if you are good enough right. you do option a which is the postdoc and and in that sense it it was a growing discontent and if you speak with the many postdocs they the many people struggle with that too, which is you need to find, you need to publish papers, I need to publish and publish and publish because that's the only way you get a you get a, a tenure position, and then that's how you continue can continue, can continue to do that. But even if that was not in the mix, even if you had the the position assured by some miracle or whatever, there is still the question of that that I I try to explain, which is the many of the world challenges have scientific underpinnings and many of the world society challenges have scientific underpinnings like data underpinnings mm -hmm. so to me it stands to reason that scientists should be more involved not only with describing the issue or right. creating knowledge but also putting that knowledge to work or understanding the known and ideal conditions. We in science we love to sell in ideal conditions, uh, because that's how um, experiments work. When you control all the variables, and then you create this knowledge, and in these conditions this happens. But when you go to reality, then it's very much not ideal conditions. And if you want any any issue has partial data, any issue has yeah. a lot of compounding factors. So scientists tend to be less. Key, except social scientists, right. uh, they, they tend to be less keen on those factors. But if you re, if you want to understand the problem, great. But if you want to solve the issue, then you need to deal with the things that are not ideal conditions. One of the things that I was thinking about when I was reading uh, your your book was, this is why personally I went towards engineering and not the academia aspect of things. So towards the the industry, mm. my understanding is was and probably still is very flawed but was kind of like so there's science which tries to find new knowledge and kind of put, put it on the the shelf of, of all human knowledge and then there's the engineers who tries to 
to go to the library, visit it, and find the book that's relevant for the problem they're trying to solve. So it's like a, a two-step process where one is trying to expand the, the knowledge that we have without necessarily knowing um, how it might be useful right now. And then the engineering side is the one that takes this uh, more theoretical approach um, and, and tries to apply it. And that, that was my vision. Um, that, that was my understanding, I mean, of, of how it is. Uh, what do you yeah. think of, of that definition um, and that kind of dimensionality between the the scientist and, and the engineer that are trying to solve something. Could very well be, uh, Maxim. It's the, I also struggle with that in the sense that maybe all I was longing for is that I wanted to be an engineer <laughs> in this quest. <laughs> I wanted to not only not a scientist, but an engineer. I, and I will try to answer that question, but I think it also begs the pause and say, hey, maybe we are trying to put um, buckets to, yeah. too, too small of a bucket. Hey, but you're a scientist, but at, what kind of scientist are you? Is it basic science or is it applied science? Yeah, yeah. And in basic science, is it like, for example, astrophysics, which has absolutely no um, no relation with society problems today, or and it's more like about uh, stars and galaxies yeah. and black holes, all these things, or are you working on, I don't know, the quality of the water uh, and the physics of the uh, physical and chemistry of the quality of the water, which does have an impact? So maybe I want in that if, if we try to make a smaller and a smaller buckets, it's basically just changing the bucket. But I think it's also worth thinking that maybe we should explore more cross horizontal right. buckets. Maybe what I'm trying to say is that there's so many years that are very close to industry and then so many mm -hmm. years that have more scientific background and maybe some, some scientists have an engineering mindset. I genuinely believe that we have, we have divided the, the human wisdom into, into um, buckets and have gone extremely good at making those buckets very deep. But now right. at, at crossing across buckets or across the ivory towers, if you want on the science or the specializations in engineering. And it is in the interface between these buckets. It is in the, in the cross pollinization that I believe it's what is holding a whole lot of progress in society is when you have someone who knows a lot about plasma physics of the sun, like my, my and what I was studying, and then goes to study satellite images and says, hey, the, the, the solar images we were working with and we had to do all these things, we can use the same skills yeah. for this earth observation. And it's the same one for uh, I know, traffic flows in the Philippines. It, se it seems crazy, but I chose yeah. those three examples because those are three examples and I personally was involved with. I work at the World Bank and I was working on managing or trying to improve the, the traffic um, in, in Cebu, in Manila, and also work a lot on Earth observation. And I also did plasma physics in the sun. And it led me to believe that while knowledge can be clustered in buckets, skills should not. Yeah. And if you, if you base the value if you base the value of a scientist on the skill, skill-based value, not knowledge-based value, then these differences of engineering and science become much, much more um, <clears throat> secondary. Like my value is not that I'm a working dictionary of astrophysics, like I'm a, mm. uh, like a working, working Wikipedia of whatever topics I chose. I think my skills that are less replicable or why that's why I, I, I've been the receiving end of a lot of investments, public investments on education, is my skills and my skills yeah. can be applied for solar physics but also for for society problems and that's that's the missing link and that's why this question of do you want to be an engineer or a scientist it might it might is is a title you can call me an engineer it's totally fine i have nothing absolutely nothing against being called or <laughs> being an engineer it's more i'm a skill-based professional right that sounds weird. <laughs> no, I like that. And and do you think that's also where, um, s like, as you go through your education as a, as a scientist, is that do you think we we should put that emphasis more on that about like yeah you might oh, be studying definitely. astrophysics, but it's it's more about what you apply it to. Um, Absolutely, I. It, this this might put in a lot of other topics that we are happy to talk to, mm -hmm. but I think in the future titles and degrees will matter less and less, and right. skills will matter more and more. Even in my own hiring, when when I had to hire people 
in institutions I was in the position to hire, degrees matter to me less and less. And I am a person whose degrees should matter a lot, right? I have a PhD, in, which is the highest title one can get in an educational um, setting. And to me, it was not important when I was hiring that someone had a PhD, because especially in the private sector, in the academia it could be different. But in the private sector, I want these things done. Yeah. And I know the skills. I don't, I don't, the degrees, I could assume if you have a degree in, I don't know, environmental uh, science, you would have the knowledge. But at the end, I, I want problems solved on day one and on day 100. And I know that if I ask you, hey, can you, do you have the skills to solve the problem I have today? Then that's a skill-based uh, question. If I ask about the day 100, to me is where, when the degrees are more important because one of the biggest values I think degrees come with is that it proves you, low, you know how to learn or it assumes right. that you know how to learn. So then maybe on day one, you don't know this thing, but I know that if you have a PhD, I know you know how to learn. And then on day 100, you can grow to the position I want you to be on day 100. And that's why skills to me are much more important than degrees. So if we keep going down that, that path, what do you think, like this is going to be a super broad question, what do you think education should look like when it's, it's focused towards the emphasis on, on skills rather than, than the knowledge? Like, you know, education as a whole, what does it mean? What, what should we aspire to in, in, in a world where the degrees are not what we're chasing, but the, the skill is? I, it's a really good question. And I'm, I'm going through that process with my wife because um, we need to, we start to think what kind of education we want to give to our son. Right. And I was, I was educated in an extremely classical way. I was educated in the public system in Spain, which was basically, um, you have this curricula and you have to learn these things and all the way from like high, middle school to, to my um, degree in, in physics, you have as a quota every year of these 20 chapters with this, every yeah. chapter has these things and you have to memorize those things and then prove in the exam you memorized it. And I have came through that and I think it was, it was, I came through that pretty well and I know I have this set of knowledge and skills and we have in this conversation on how skills are more important than knowledge. She was trained in a much more, in a different way. She went to Universal World College, UWC, I don't know if you heard of it, but it's, no. and then other, other settings where the, where the emphasis was on self like also the Montessori, all, all these kind of uh, different educational, educational um, strategies, which is more about creating curiosity in yourself and letting that, that drive your progress in, in education, which, which means that you direct what you want to learn. Hey, I want to know more about math, and then you do that. And she came out really well. She's an extremely educated person. She has, she started her own company and, and I'm super proud of, of her education. In, these are completely different ways of educating someone, right? Self-directed and, and yet going the way you want to go or, or creating what we would say like a baseline right. of, of minimum knowledge you want. I, I still think you need a basics and no one will choose to learn algebra or yeah. topology. No yes. one would choose to, to learn plasma physics, but maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe you don't, maybe I don't need to learn like, I don't know, um, uh, algebra mathematics to be what I am today. Or maybe if I needed it, right. and if I, if I grow enough interest, then I would go to learn it. So yeah. I don't sorry. know, I, I sorry, because it was, I, I was just summarizing that. I see that creating interest in the person to choose their own path is extremely important right. and will be extremely important in the future, but I also struggle in a world that being a highly educated person does not come with the assumption that you've covered the basics yeah, of I see. things that you might not choose. So one, there's, a, there's a few things that come to my mind there. Um, personally, I feel like I'm a, a I've gone through both paths. I, I studied through engineering school, like very classical in, in France. Those are a, a big thing. Um, so you do five years and you follow that course about here's what you do. Um, and then I studied aerospace mechanical engineering as I go on every episode about. Um, 
And so at the end, I knew how to, you know, this is how you, you build rockets um, and stuff like that. Knew nothing about software, but then that's where the interest come in. And I had that linear algebra, the, the really hardcore math and physics and, and things like that. And I think that was great because I had that understanding of, I know what I need to learn next. And, and had I not had that baseline, I think it would have been a lot harder. Um, so the, I think I agree a little bit with, with having that basics, I think is very important so that then you have enough knowledge to know what you need to learn next. Because if you come out of nowhere and you're like, um, I want to build a, a mobile app, for example, and, and you've never done that, you can start Googling around, but you actually don't really know how, how to, how to get there. Um, so I, I feel like there's a little bit of, of both that, that might be required. And you, you mentioned, trying to figure out for, for your child, how are you kind of thinking about doing that, about approaching that? that ha, have you thought about that as well, about maybe combining a little bit of, of both? How, how do you get started? I mean, you have p p plenty of time to, to think about it, but because yeah. it, it seems very applicable, I'm quite curious to know what, what you might be yeah. learning on these days. I, again, I think it's similar to the last answer. I, I'm still trying to figure out the answer to that. And what I think it's, I've come to the conclusion is that it is not that important. I think right. both it, both paths lead to yeah. both paths can lead to success, and both the paths can let people hang in without a future. I think there is a lot of people who have extremely good basics because they've done all of that, and they are they don't they can't really find a job or they can feel it, find something that fulfills them, and because they are so constraint in that basic knowledge, harder for them to move to another field. Versus someone who has been self-directed probably can have an easier time crossing fields, but then in those fields might not have the basics to, to, to grow to the degree. Like for example, if you don't have a PhD, you will never advance more than whatever level in a public place, yeah. like in a, the World Bank, or and you have to have an MBA, or you have to have those things. Right. Yet there is the world is full of people with PhDs that are unemployed. <laughs> so it's 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 hard. I I know that Mapbox, the company that I I help grow, uh, a special mapping a company, in the beginning had, if I remember correctly, only one person had computer science degree. It had right. philosophers. It had musicians. I know we and. We know probably you know two companies who are fully completely made apps completely made by people who've never gone through a formal schooling. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a ton of examples of people who to self-directed learning uh, can can lead to wherever you want to be, except in places where you need because mm -hmm. it's more classical and you need the degree and blah blah blah. But the, the the opposite is also true, where where places where you have those degrees and then you you cannot find it. So, if we want to maximize for options, so horizontal movement, I would I think I would choose a more self directed approach. Right. If you know where you want to go or you what you want to do is more classical, like I don't know, uh, medicine. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. That's a great space, point. That's a great one. Then, then you know the rules of the game, and probably those rules of the game would not change. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a very good point. If you want to be in computer science, there's like a billion ways to get there. But if you want to become a surgeon, there's pretty much only one way. You're not going to become a surgeon by learning <laughs> online, uh, or as far as I know. Hey, prove me wrong. But um, that's one of the things I find very interesting in the geospatial industry. Is I feel like it's common that people don't come from it, from an education. They, they come from so many, it, it's kind of like the norm. Um, this is why I find this part, that I wanted to do this podcast is like realizing that, hey, wait, actually, um, there's not that many people who studied geography or, or GIS or anything like that. So could you kind of walk me through how you ended up in, in geospatial and, and how you went from astrophysics, um, yeah, yeah, to to this wonderful world that is geospatial. <laughs> <laughs> you might be biased, uh, but yes, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, um, I think, by the way, the, I think the answer to or part of the answer of why so many people in Earth's 
come from different places is because health observation, I think, is a subset of data science. Again, yeah, exactly. buckets are not buckets are not always useful. But if we if I had to put health observation in a bucket, it would be within data science. And yeah. data science does not have formal training. Yeah. It's not like physics or chemistry or mathematics that there is universities. Now there is, of course, because it's so massively uh, employable, there are masters and courses on data science, but that's right. starting, yeah, yeah. So it stands to reason that people come from somewhere else because even if you knew you wanted to be a data scientist, I would recommend people um, probably to come from it from a side angle from a specific field or like many of people that anyway. So my my personal story in how to get to that was, as I mentioned, physics. I knew I like astrophysics, I did that. And I was solar physics, the, the field that I ended up because I love the sun. It's one of the reasons I like the sun so much is, is that it's the closest thing of the universe that is the closest to us. Is, is still part of the universe, right? This is a, actually is a very normal middle age, middle weight, middle everything, extremely standard um, astrophysical thing. Yet for us, it's extremely important. It's very close yeah. to us. So we want to understand the universe. The sun seems a really good, a really good stepping stone to, to understand the mysteries of black holes and all of these things. Yet we don't know, even though it's, Every day, by definition, every day, because that's what defines a day, that the sun is there. Um, every day we see the sun, and there's so many things we don't understand yeah. from the sun. Um, we don't even know. So I, if you allow me these 30 seconds, in 30 seconds, Please. I will put you at the edge of the knowledge, of at the edge of the human knowledge in terms of the sun. We know the sun is hot. And indeed, it's very hot. And in the inside of the, of the sun, and we, we know that from different ways, it's hotter. It stands to reason that if the heat comes from the center, the center will be the hottest. And indeed, that is the case. Everything checks out so far. The, the center of the sun is extremely hot, millions of degrees. And then as you go to the surface, it goes to um, like 6,000 Kelvin or so. And that what we call the surface is the, the place where we cannot see through, like the place that is so dense that that we that's the last thing we see, right? But above that place, there's still some material, and we can see that some half opaque stuff. That half opaque stuff is way hotter than the surface, up to one million again. We don't know why. We don't know why the atmosphere of the sun is hotter than the surface of the sun. And it makes no sense if the heat comes from the sun. We have some hypotheses of mm. interaction of magnetic fields and da da da, but we don't know. And it's a whole mystery that it's in studying not in our face because it, a lot of things like space weather and other things depend on the interaction of these things. So in maybe forty seconds, but <laughs> in, in forty seconds I can put anyone at the edge of the human knowledge yeah. in terms of solar physics, which. To me, it's fascinating when we have the sun so close. Anyway, so that was the, um, the path I did. I did my postdoc. I came to the US to do a, a rocket science postdoc with, with NASA and basically putting a telescope in a rocket. And then very um, cool. It was really cool. It was uh, my job was to, my job was to calibrate the camera because we are serving for that reason, for the uh, heating of the solar atmosphere, we, we, we had ultraviolet telescopes and the atmosphere of the earth doesn't let that through thankfully mm -hmm. otherwise everyone will have skin cancer and yeah, so great. we put the we put the telescope with the ultraviolet in this rocket we send the rocket up we observe for like two minutes then the rocket goes down and you spend a million dollars and that is why but, space is expensive but if you then you want to put the same telescope in a satellite, which costs hundred millions of dollars or more, then you better check in a couple of uh, rocket flights that the system yeah. works before putting it in a satellite. That's indeed what happened. That telescope then ended up being part of a, of a satellite emission that you cannot do what like with it of calibrating and stuff like that. And I absolutely love my work doing that stuff. But I had this growing sense of wanting to be more involved with society problems of right. 
how can the things like I I love where I work, but it was so it was in the U.S. It was part of the uh, the laboratory was part of the Department of Defense, which meant that there was like a lot of like security clearances and uh, ITAR regulations yeah. and things, which is for those who don't know about it, is basically a regulation that says that things that could be inter interpreted or used as weapons cannot be known by uh, non-Americans. My job was to calibrate a camera in a rocket. So <laughs> that was very close to what mm. some people could consider ITAR. So that's why even I remember some meetings where I, I had to step out of the room because wow. they wanna um they wanna talk about um the blueprints of the chips and stuff like that. Which I knew what the, I mean I had to calibrate those. And going back to the to the knowledge of basics, physics and mathematics, if I see an image and I see certain things on the image, I know how the chip is made. Because yeah. it leaves an imprint, like the, the kind of noise that you see on the signals, the kind of stripes, the direction of the stripes, all those things, you know, what the direction the camera is reading from, or what is the response to the signal, or how that, anyway. Um, that was that was really cool. I love the stuff I was working on, but I, I had a growing disconnect, a growing discontent right. to, to apply it to other issues. And even if I could, so that's why I talked to some people, no one gave me a good answer, and I quit. I, okay. I decided that I didn't want to do the postdoc anymore. I didn't have a visa, so I had like a month to leave the US. And um, it was hard. Like, even yeah. of course, my parents were super proud of me because I was living the dream in Washington, D.C. with a fancy job postdoc. And yeah, it was, it was, it was tough in that. I mean, I was happy. I was healthy. I was living in the U.S. So it couldn't be that hard, but... Uh, professionally, it was it was tough, and then I, in my naivete, this is embarrassing to admit, but in my naivete, I thought um, scientists have all the answers, and everyone should be glad that a scientist wants to be part of the solutions of uh, mm. climate change, for example. So I said, if I cannot find a job in the US, I'm gonna go to Africa, and I decided that I was gonna go to Africa to work as a what I thought was science for social um, for um, um, science policy. And I, since in many places in Africa they speak French, I went to French class to, to um, I had done it in high school, so I wanted to get better. Thankfully, I did in this French class, I met someone who was working on an NGO in, that, in DC and, and they thought I could, I could be helpful in that NGO. And then I ended up working in that NGO. I'm not, I have no idea what would have happened if I, <laughs> if I went through, I, I don't even know where I would have gone. Who knows, maybe in another world, Bruno was extremely successful working with an NGO in, I don't know, South Africa or... Mm -hmm. I ended up working, funnily enough, I've, I've done many trips to Africa, hopefully to help as part of the World Bank, as part of a science consultant. I've been to refugee camps in Kakuma, I've done some courses in South Africa, in um, also um, in um, how is the name? Um, what is that car? What is what is the country where the car is? I totally oh, this is embarrassing. I, I should know as well as a as a I'm, French. I'm, I should know that. Uh, so, anyway, so, I was Senegal. Yes, Senegal. Yeah, Senegal. There we Senegal. go. Google just said Senegal. <laughs> I, I went to um, well, my friends in Senegal are going to kill me if they hear this. Anyway, I ended up going to many places and, and doing training on data science and geospatial and the amazing things you can do. We can talk about it later yep. later on. But you were asking about the path to, to yep. Earth observation. I'm sorry that it's getting a little bit longer, but hopefully no, please don't. <laughs> that helps clarify. Um, mm -hmm. And the way it worked, and this could be also helpful. This NGO that I found through my French class, they said, Bruno, we don't need a rocket scientist uh, mm. for this. So thank you very much. And it didn't work. And then I was super frustrated because I, I, was, not my, I, I was seen as a, as a rocket scientist for my own knowledge, not for my skills. If I had the skills that you yeah. need to be a rocket scientist, which is, of course, includes data analytics, and this NGO wanted to work on climate change, um, it needs data analytics. So why not? Why not trying it? I'm not asking for a, I was going to say a rocket scientist salary, but it's not that the rocket scientist salaries are very high. Um, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> my salary as a postdoc 
as rocket scientist in NASA, if I remember correctly, was 58,000. Um, and my salary at the NGO later on was 90. So, okay. <laughs> so that was almost half of, um, anyway. So um, I, they said the NGO the first time, they say, no, we don't need a rocket scientist mm. for that. Thank you very much. But then a week later, they say, hey, we've hired someone with a degree on environmental science to help us. And if you want to help this person build the model, because they had to build a model of climate change, um, yeah. of which I said I didn't know anything. I was not trying to pretend I knew things I didn't know. I, I said, hey, I know that I know how to work with data. And they said, look, we don't need you, but we have this person who is starting. And if you want to, I don't know, just talk to him, help him figure out how, if, if there's something we can help. They were really keen on that. They, they, they gave me an opportunity for right. which I'm extremely thankful. Because what I realized is that even though I didn't know climate change, once the, that person put on the table of the variables that were important and what are, was the intended outcome, the, the, the matrix thing or the, the ranking and all of those numbers, I knew exactly what to do, how yeah. to do it, how to check how things work, how to, make, how to find correlation, how to find, interpolate between the missing values, how to find proxies that didn't, we didn't have. It took me a weekend to make the whole thing because it was extremely easy for me and for mm. anyone who knows how to do interpolations between numbers and how to do um, basically normalized values between thresholds, just, just do it. It's a lot of numbers because it's 120 countries, 15 years and 100 variables. So it's just a big number, yeah. but come on, if you do it in, I did it in, in, <laughs> I did it in Google Docs and then I did it in Python and then in Visual Basic. Uh, for Excel because the economies work Excel. But anyway, on Monday, I came back to the room and I presented that to the to the NGO to say, hey, this is how I did it. And this is the result. These are the plots. They asked me to please go. They, they, they bought me a flight ticket to go to Spain and say, hey, um, we want you to start working tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so since you cannot work, because I, I was, didn't have a visa, then please go home, go home, go to Spain, start working from Spain. We're gonna start the process for getting your visa tomorrow. And then you fly back to start working with us. And that happened. I went back to Spain and spent like a couple of months there until they figured out my, my visa for the NGO. And that's how I broke through. That's how I explained it with a bit more detail is that that's how I broke through outside of academia because an NGO, it gave me the opportunity to to demonstrate that I was not just a rocket scientist. That I had mm. skills that were extremely useful. And then from that, that was already data science. We used some remote sensing. And then from that, I hired a company to do the the our the thing I had done better with maps. That company was Development Seat, whose CEO right. you interview yep. at the time was Eric Gundersen. Mm -hmm. And that company was making maps in every single project that we're, we were working on. So they say, why don't we spin out a company that only focuses on making maps? That was Mapbox. And then when I joined, when, when I was at the NGO, they asked me, hey, Bruno, we are starting this company, Mapbox, and do you want to join? And I said, of course. And then I left the NGO and I went to Mapbox a couple of years helped grow it from like, I don't know, 10 people to, I think it was 200 when I left. Right. And that was, that was amazing. And then this opportunity at the World One came and I jumped to work on, have to work more in detail of this. I love working on development issues with data science skills and more your special again. At the end of the two years, I realized that I, I pretended to know development issues from an office in Washington DC, which didn't seem to be very complete. And even the, the president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, at the time, when he was John, he started an organization that wanted to close the World Bank. Okay. <laughs> uh, Partners in Health. And then he ended up being the, the World Bank president. One of the, th <laughs> the things he said is that, one of the reasons I said that the World Bank should be closed is that you cannot learn development uh, in in the in the computer screen or in a, an office with AC, you have to have he would say mud on your toes. You have to right. have done it, understand the struggles out of on the ground. So I took that to heart and I quit the my fancy again position at the World Bank and I went to 
to figure that out and I ended up living for a few months in Bhutan yeah and that's when I I was helping a, a company a company you know, a cooperative um to to do their data science skills which involved a lot of open street map this audience I'm sure they know open street map and also um remote sensing uh, landsat images all of that stuff right and I blah 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 I can't continue with the things I've done but <laughs> that was basically I think that the, the useful bit in yeah. that part is how did I go from academia to remote sensing it was through through startups through um development and how can data science and your special help in development and then um in different stakeholders from the fanciest ones like the yeah. world one to the ones with the most need on the ground like uh in Bhutan yeah this is very interesting because to me it sounds like you kind of discovered on the spot this what what now we call data science about like hey wait i can solve this problem this is stuff that that i know um what, what you were talking about earlier where it took you only a weekend like just listening to you talk about that it's like yeah this is a very basic workflow of of data science like having to handle missing data and trying to make a, a simple interpolation um so this is very interesting because it feels like uh you know now there's you know, as you said data science is becoming a huge thing there's there's degrees and, and universities that are starting to do it but it kind of feels like you just kind of realized that stumbled upon it like oh this is a thing that i can also just just do like even before you knew it was a thing could be i think it was pretty much at the same time if i remember correct correctly the term data science was invented by at linkedin by right. this how was the name of this guy who became the chief data scientist for the white house um anyway I this person okay but it was it was one person who said hr linkedin wanted to put a title of this new discipline and this okay. this person who are again blanking out uh, said this is called it it's not science it's not data something let's call it data science and that right. i think was roughly at the same time but as you were point out i think the private sector especially the technology companies like google and apple or microsoft the one i'm working now realized very quickly how extremely powerful data yeah. science was and that's why data science was led by all of these technology companies and my pitch to when i was at the world one is that we've demonstrated that data science is extremely useful for for technology companies to make better advertisement or to buy widgets yes, or things like that why sexy. don't we use exactly why don't we use these skills for society problems how can we use it? at the time where facebook was starting to do a and b testing on on figuring out that blue facebook is better than red facebook or green yeah. facebook why don't we start working on those issues in developing countries with development data in development environments which means poor data poorer resources that's i one of the blog posts i wrote very, very early on in medium that's the, probably the most read it was a uh, um out of the spice that i called cheap data science okay. it was at the time where everyone was thinking about more computing power more computing power more data more data big data i was i was saying hey what if we try to do the opposite what is the most what is the most we can do with the cheapest computer it was also when i was joining the world bank and i remember the procurement process of of a big institution like the world one takes time so it took like a month for them to give me my laptop um <laughs> and i was very frustrated because i'm a data scientist i want my laptop today and i wanted to start doing things so out of desperation i crossed the street and i went to like a best buy or whatever it's called and i bought the cheapest computer i could find and i told to myself i'm gonna try to do as the most i can with this cheap laptop like an ubuntu um Linux, all that stuff. And I ended up doing a ton of things and doing extremely, I remember doing clustering of GPS points for the Philippines project. Um, instead of using fancy Spark or all these things that were starting to be a thing, I remember using just Pass and using all of these Unix command line utilities that were developed in the 80s or 70s and ended up getting extremely high processing rates because now the computers are much more efficient and yeah. that's what led to this cheap data science 
article of, hey, how can we make data science as cheaply as possible? I love this. It is, this is such a cool story. I, I'm a huge believer in um, adding constraints when learning stuff as well, um, be it on the spot when you don't really have a choice or, or even by choice um, yeah, about exactly. like, take, take all those fancy stuff that you do and just remove it. What can you do with just a few gigs of RAM for, for, for computing, uh, you know, that is. And, and yeah. it's, it's so interesting. I, I went a little bit through the same process um, through Kaggle, not having a, uh, a, a, uh -huh. a, a computer. All I had was my, my notebook and the Kaggle environments. And they, so Kaggle is this machine learning competition yeah, yeah. place. And when I was doing it, they started adding these GPU limits. So you only had a few hours of GPU time. And that was like the most precious thing that you could have to, to train your models when you didn't have anything. And so we started having these tricks about how do you decouple? We were basically making pipelines like you would do when you deploy stuff on the cloud without knowing it, because like this is where the GPU time happens. But if you do just your pre-processing, you don't need it. So start decoupling stuff without even knowing yeah. it. And then so that resonates a lot because I feel like I've gone through that same process and learned so much by stripping out as, as much as possible and seeing just how much you can do. That's where clever ideas, I feel, um, come out. Yes. It's, I, I think innovation comes from two main sources, uh, limitation mm -hmm. and playfulness. Yeah. And, and this, uh, these are two types, different types of innovation engines. Limitation, when, when you, you limit either artificially or you are limited, for yeah. whatever reason, and then you have to innovate by necessity. But then there's the other type, which is the playfulness, just playing around with things, and then you have to find them. There is also a really cool story on these limitations. How this is, I, I hope, hopefully we can find the link and put it on the notes. Sure. But uh, many years ago, YouTube was tracking some numbers of loading times, and they they kept improving the load pages for YouTube and the loading times kept decreasing and it made no sense how is it that the faster we are loading the more the on the loading in principle then on the ground in the world the average gets getting lower and lower and lower and lower and it was it only took them a long time to to realize why and the reason was that because it loaded faster people with poorer connection started to have the patience to actually load a video. Because if it takes right. a minute, if it takes a minute, you just don't do it. But if it takes ah. 30 seconds, then you wait. So, so it crossed the it threshold. Meant, they were, they were di digging deeper and deeper to a cohort of people who were accessing YouTube with uh, slower and low, slower terminals and slower and slower connections and slower and slower computers. They were reaching the cheap, the cheaper infrastructure on mm. the most in need, which made them realize that first of all, proxies sometimes have a problem, and this is something yeah, to learn. To learn is that lesson. proxies measure usually measure something different that you want to measure. You have to be mindful of those limitations, and that's how they. If I remember correctly, and I know Facebook does this too, there is one day a week where they artificially lower the. Some people kind of artificially lower the access to the internet, so that they can experience how how the internet is when you have a 2G right. phone or a 3G phone. But yeah, it's a really cool story. And also now with, um, with Kaggle and you were sharing, especially with machine learning, that is so resource intensive. And yeah. especially as we think about the environmental impact of, of, for example, machine learning and deep learning methods. That's why it's also extremely important to think about how can we cheapen the cost of yeah. computation in that sense. And that's why, for example, a infrastructure like Fast AI, which is a framework yeah. that I absolutely love, yeah, I love from them. Jeremy Howard and Rachel. Um, they, um, I've known them, they are, they are fantastic, they're amazing people. They focus a lot on, for example, retraining, so that you need to tra retrain in a like when you have a model that already recognizes mm -hmm. I don't know, circles and plots and whatever, you just chop the last layers of the, the model and then you add new empty ones and then you start from that and that proves to be extremely powerful yeah. to avoid the retraining. So that, again, the idea of imposing limitations on yourself or playfulness leads to huge progress on innovation. Yeah, I love 
Jeremy Howard's um, fast AI, that the pragmatic approach that, that comes from that is, is, is wonderful. I'll also link to that. If, if people are wondering about how to get into machine learning, Kaggle, Absolutely. which Jeremy Howard is also very tied towards, um, and fast AI, I think, are, are wonderful uh, resources. So, he was a chief scientist at Kaggle. Yeah, 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 yeah that's... Yeah, he has he he has um, he's quite tied to, to Kaggle as well. He he got into it like that. There's some really cool interviews as well of him that I'll I'll put links towards. I I want to move forward a little bit. Um, so we go we went through a little bit of of your career, and I want to ask I want to come back to your book, um, and I want to start asking why you wrote the this book. What kind of led you to wanting to write this book and ultimately doing it because it's i can imagine a lot of, of, of work to go through that um and uh, yeah I, i'm just very curious to know what led you to sitting down and being like i'm going to write this book um, about impact science and your story three reasons <laughs> one i wanted to write the book i wish i had when i was at university yeah and so basically this book is explicitly, but not exclusively dedicated or meant for anyone who's studying um, science or engineering and is thinking about how, um, how to maximize, maximize impact in society, how to navigate all those uncertainties. That's num reason number one. Number two was um, I wanted to explore, explore historical cases where this idea was, um, on the table, either part of the success or part of the failure. And I want to explore, like, what's at stake? Is impact science a thing? And if it's a thing, there should be cases where we fail to use it. And I put a couple of examples that HIV AIDS mm -hmm. is a massive case where we fail to do that. I think climate change is another case where failing to use uh, science for the whole scope of impact. We are great at creating knowledge. We are not so great at putting knowledge to work uh, as a policy or as part of um, operations by uh, companies. In general, there are many good cases. Um, there are other cases of failure in that sense. Yeah. And then cases of success. And I talk about a couple of them also in the book, like the ozone layer, how yeah. we realized there was a problem of that. And, and then how we, uh, in a few years, um, signed the, the treaty, the Montreal prot Protocol, to close it and explain how that happened, because it's clearly something that was very hard to understand. We, we don't yet fully understand how ozone chemistry works, yet we were able to mobilize using policy aspects and private sector incentives and patents incentives and academia and conferences to, to achieve the goal, which in that case was disagreement that is and the ways to enforce agreement so that the ozone the layer ultimately closes, which is what we are managing to do. And that was a, a case of success. And I wanted to talk about that. Another one is the moonshot, like literally the going to the moon. I think it was a case where it was very science engineering driven, but it also needed a specific way of handling it and the private sector and da, 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 and talk about that in the book. And then the third reason is that I wanted to travel the world. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to interview people that were in this space. I wanted to literally, like you're doing now, of, of hey, I, people who are in the space that I want to just ask questions. Then uh, I wanted to do it physically. It was pre-COVID world. So I had a bunch of friends and friends of friends who were around the world. And I basically, I, when I quit the World Bank and I, after spending a few months in Bhutan, I wanted to use my savings for that. Right. So I flew to Hong Kong, I flew to Argentina, I flew to South Africa, I flew to all this um, refugee camp in Kakuma. So I was trying to, while I was doing my consulting job sometimes, which I tried to do it extremely expensive so that I did only just a few days so that I could spend right. most of the time doing other things or doing them for free. Like when I was in Bhutan, obviously I didn't charge them. Uh, anything and when I was in other places I didn't do that either in the Balkans or in other places but in all of those places I would try to ask um, people either scientists that have gone to do other roles or people who were managing complex issues 
what's the role of science? What's the role of a scientist? Why you don't have a scientist with you? Or why you mm. do have a scientist with you? Or scientists who ended up in other places, what has been useful to you? I, for example, a case I didn't do, but I would have loved to do is Angela Merkel is a physicist. I would yeah. love to ask her, how has science been important to you? Right. For example. Yeah, or what is a lot on her plates? Well, I know. I mean, in, in terms of the things that she needs to to handle, that's what I mean. Not not her agenda, but like that that, that would be such an interesting uh, conversation. I would love to do that. Or there's there's a ton of profiles of scientists who have gone to do other things. And my question to them is that is the, is this other thing you did a plan B because you were not good enough? Is this what you're doing a failure of investment, right. of public investment or private investment? If you go to private, private university, it's totally fine, but it's still the same question. Are you doing the thing you were trained for or not? What is the value of the skills you learn? And in the in society challenges we face today, which I would very much put above the fault, climate change, biodiversity collapse, and political polarization, and then the rest. The, to me, those three problems, which are also interrelated, are the biggest problems we face in, mm. in humanity and society today. Uh, then what is the role of scientists? What is the role of engineers? What is the role of, is it knowledge creation? Is it making widgets better? Or is it being in part of the decision making of all of these stakeholders, part of those governments, part of those companies. Like I love the fact that, for example, Microsoft now has a chief environmental officer, which is my my boss. That would have been crazy a few years ago. No one right. had those. The Australia and UK have chief science advisors, not many more countries. What is in the book I talk about science diplomacy? It's a thing. Science diplomacy, I would argue, was part of why we managed to do the ozone layer uh, so well. Science diplomacy is part of why we were able to pull through the IPCC and all of the reports and, and do a lot of progress there. I would argue limited in that sense because we're still making papers of climate change, but the, the actions are far behind what the science says. But then that, what is the, right. how do we make that happen? Is it the scientist's fault or is it society's fault? Or is it both's fault? Because they tend to say, hey, no, my role is to be up here making papers and my role here is to make uh, things that people want to buy and we keep not doing things. So that was, that was the three reasons I made the book. Because the book I wanted to, when I, to read when I was in university, because I wanted to explore historical cases of, of when that happened or didn't happen. And also because I wanted to, to travel the world and ask these persons, all of these people directly, and then distill all those conversations into the book. And do you think uh, you were successful in, in doing those three things in, in writing the book? Like, cause I'm guessing that's also a process, like it, it takes a while. So, and I'm guessing just like your career, there's things that you, you thought you were doing and then might change yeah. down the line. Well, I, I don't, I guess I, it's, it will be for the readers now <laughs> to say if it was successful on the first count. I am extremely open to send the book to anyone, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, it's Creative Commons, so that there's absolutely no limitation for anyone to read it. Uh, I've, I've sent 20 copies of the book to each American university. <laughs> Uh, to the division of uh, of student progress and what they do when they finish up. And I don't that all the same with a, a bunch in, in Europe. It's just easy in the US. It's, it's, it's a bunch of clips. That's why I focus more in the in the US, not because they need it more. I've also talked about it. I do every year. I do. I talk about the book in other cases and I this, mm. this podcast. So on the first count of the book I wish I had read when I was in university, it's up to the reader to say if right. I if I managed to do something well or not. On the second one, I discovered a few cases and that's the ones I, I explore in the book and maybe I missed some. I certainly know COVID is a chapter that should be added on, on, the, on the book and probably more on the political polarization side, which I think all these fake news and all of the issues we had right. at the polarization of the facts, science um, uh, it has has a bigger play to role that the one has played and a less paternalistic one that the one has 
has played. And then the first count, it was extremely successful. I've spent a year and a half traveling the entire <laughs> world from the Arctic to Latin America, Asia, everywhere. And I had a hell of fun. I found my um, uh, girlfriend and wife, the mother of my kids. So I would say that then the third yeah. count was extremely successful. I mean, just for that, I think, yeah, it definitely is a success. Um, I, I, I really think this notion, like, first of all, reading your book was um, really interesting. I actually had a hard time putting it down. Um, it, it, was a, it was a great read <laughs> because it felt like something that I kind of wish I had heard more uh, in, in learning kind of the, the data science kind of thing. There's this huge emphasis on, <laughs> um, on um, you know, this is how you solve a problem. You get, you aggregate the data. When, when you're doing data science, there is a little bit of talk and, and yet not that much about how you get the data in the first place. Like that's already a big uh, thing that's a little bit lacking. But then, so you make your model, you validate it, and then it's kind of like problem solved. But what I got from your book was like, no, that's like step one is you get, you get something from the data. And if, if um, I mean, like, that's the skills that I have is like, okay, I can, I can tell you the data says, this is what you should be doing. This is, mm -hmm. this is what my job yeah. is actually. And this yeah. is what a lot of data scientists are. And, but it was about how do you take that and make sure that people can do something with it? How do you communicate exactly. that? How do you, how do you turn that into the problem is solved? And that was just something that I felt was really missing and, and that your book was doing very nice. Nice. Yeah, it's from from outcomes to from output to outcomes. We yeah. are we were first so good generating data. Then we were so good processing the data. Now we are really good at making outputs, like maps, for example. We love maps. I love maps, and maps tell so much information. And we have so many good visualization techniques. But that's an output that doesn't put you any step closer to solving the issue. Yeah. These outputs to outcomes is the missing layer for data science. And the more we make progress in outputs without figuring out how to go from outcomes to outcomes, the harder it will be to, to do, I would argue. I, and that's, that's where the having working in places like in the private sector or the public sector in the world one teach you a lot. Yeah. Because I, if I sit down, um, uh, this, this is a real case. I sat down with, uh, with the president of the bank. We're talking about the agriculture and, and I kind of just say, hey, there's this paper that this random person at the university did how to analyze the crop estimations for, for this paper. And then this is just that for, for the whole continent and use that for policy, for example, or let's use nightlight. This is another real case that we presented to the government of India is like, let's use nighttime satellite images to figure out what are the, case, the places where uh, uh, you have villages with no lights. So you take the yeah. database of villages and then you take a image, a median image, and it's extremely high to, hard, hard to process all of that. But we did that with the University of Michigan and also with actually development seed. Again, it's nightlights.io. If you go, I still, I think still online. It's basically just crunching all the locations of villages and crunching all the uh, lights from beers at the SMP and then telling, okay, this is the places where you have no electricity. So ideally that's what we wanted is can we tie the loans or the departments of grants to, to those outputs on the front images. That would be an, outcome based on an output. That would be fantastic. For several reasons, it didn't happen. That's not, it's not a bad story in that sense, but it is a story how you can connect those. Uh, or in the first case, when I sit down with the, with the paper, it is my job as a data scientist at the World Bank to then take that paper, read it, understand it and say, okay, this work was done in Iowa, where there is one type of corn yeah. in like whatever hectares. Can we do the same thing in Ghana? Or can we do the same thing in, I don't know, in, in Vietnam? Then it's a question of data. Okay, let's use other satellite images from other providers. Can we do analysis on the ground and a couple of control plots? That actually happened. I was not involved in that, but there's a, there was a huge progress 
uh, for doing exactly this to do plots on the ground and at the same time observing the satellite of different resolutions to then fine tune a model that could estimate the crop yields. In reality, it turned out that small plot holders tend to mix two different types of vegetation, like, you know, like corn and coffee. I'm just making this up. But the point is that you have two different plants in the same pixel. It's really hard to make yeah. the estimation of the NDVI curves to estimate the crops. So it's an example of how outputs to outcomes uncovers a lot of complexities that you need to figure out how to solve. But the only way to solve those is not creating more papers in an idealized conditions, and then talk with all the stakeholders of that process, which in this case would be the government of that country, in this case would be a cooperative of the farmers who you want to help, and asking them, is this a problem for you? Or the government, would you be able to offer better loans or facilities if you had this information from the ground, or is not a problem for you? Because in some countries, um, the networks of knowledge work much better than our satellite images because everyone knows everyone else. That's the case of Bhutan. Yeah. Uh, everyone is like one step away from everyone else. So you just get the phone call and you know what's coming on the ground. But in some cases, it will help. And in some cases, that's the kind of things we need. And that's, that's this crucial step from outputs to outcomes, which you need to bridge. How do you bridge that? And I would argue you need to put the stakeholders talking on the same table with the same data and the same yeah. uh, uh, the same drivers of choice. And we need to understand that in many cases, it's not that data, data that is going to drive the insight or the outcome. Might be diplomacy, might be religion, yeah. might be economy, might be things that are not data-driven. That's why data-driven to me is too much of a um, strong arm, is data-informed. It's totally fine if mm. you don't do something for religious reasons. We should be okay in a world where we don't do some things for diplomatic reasons or it has, it's part of the culture. It's just, you, you cannot impose something that the society will yeah. not. And the book is also examples of things that data-driven were worked and then on the ground didn't yeah. for these reasons, cultural or otherwise. So I'm happy to tell you some examples, but they are on the book. Yeah. So that, I think that we can leave it there. Like, just go read yeah. the book if you want to hear about them. Because, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. I, I find that very interesting about it, the, the way you, you bring it up kind of make, makes me think this, that data-driven is, is like a dogma in a way that might sometimes not be the best way to get to, to, to the outcome. I feel like reading that book was very humbling in a way about like, there's solving a problem has has many components, especially in different parts of the world. I think data scientists, as 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 you know, the field grows, we start to know, especially in geospatial, that yeah, if you have a model that's been done in the U.S., good luck just plugging it into Ghana. That's not going to work nicely. I think people are starting to realize that, but yet we have we don't really have that um, conversation about when it comes time to deploying it to, to making it yeah. useful. I, I think back to what you were saying with YouTube, just saying, you know, you can have a great platform online. If people don't have something to load it from, uh, your platform online is great, but it's it's useless. And I feel like these things, I, I, I'm yeah. grateful that there's more talk about that. But I think having more examples of that and, and seeing people talk about how they went from, we, we found that solution to, well, it turns out that was not how we, we solved the problem. Is definitely mm -hmm. exactly that yeah. um, I want to hear more about uh, from from the field in in general. And we should be held accountable. Those yeah. we should take, if we let's if we take a problem, whatever problem it is. Let's take for example climate change, and we map the stakeholders of climate change. And certainly, governments are going to be there at all levels, from international governments, national levels, city level governments, or even county level governments. And then we have the private sector from the big companies to the small companies to the startups. And we also have the scientists, uh, postdocs, students, all that. And we have the citizens. We map all of those. And I think we should then create a list to hold accountable each one of them for the whole problem, not just part of the problem. Right. The, the scientists will say, hey, I create knowledge and then it's everyone else's problem. No, because you might create a problem. We, you might create knowledge that is unusable to the city council. 
So there should be some scientist at the city council office to say, hey, this is the knowledge that the scientists created and this is how I can translate that. But also the city council might say, hey, I need employment. I cannot, I cannot close the plastic factory because it's 50% yeah. of the employment. And that is true. And that is true. If you close the plastic, which is everyone agrees that um, it's a problem, then what do you do with all the employment of all the people? If we could close today, it's, it's realistic. If we yeah. could close today all the petrol companies, all of them, we couldn't do that. This would be it would mayhem because every single thing depends on that. So yeah. we need to decarbonize first this uh, and do it extremely fast, but we need to do it. So scientists cannot just say we need to stop emissions today. Yes, we do. How? What do we do with all the products we do make with petrol? What do we do with all the people whose employment or countries whose income mm. depends on all of that? We need to decarbonize. And for that, your help, scientist or engineer or data scientist, will be extremely useful. How do we re how do we reskill people that are working in one sector that it's clearly on a, should disappear to another sector? How do we work with policies that favor emissions to policies that favor not emissions without in, and seeing what is the impact? For all of those things, people with the skills to understand data should be part of a solution, not just making uh, websites or mm. portals or papers, which is. I, I, I just, just one quick comment yeah, is sure. that I don't want to be extremely critical to the academia. I was an academic. I love yeah. academia. I love making purpose. All I'm saying is that it's not the end of it. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, this is also from what I'm getting from this conversation. It's not just academia, but it's also people trying to, 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 to build a company to solve a problem from thinking that it's, it's going to, you know, because you make a dashboard, it's magically going to, to, to solve the problem. Um, so I, I, I feel like we're, it's not just on academia. One of the nice things that I, I found very interesting about at the end of your book is, is you give advice for people that, um, mostly for, for scientists. And I, what I found interesting is that most of those advice is not about technical or, you know, get better at this or, or you should learn that. It's, it's things that I feel yeah. like we, you know, even outside of science, are, are helpful to, to resolve situations, just like take the time to listen to people. And, and I felt like that was such uh, useful advice for, for myself, for, for people in general about this is t taking the time to, to listen, to understand to people, to, to you know, think that you don't actually know all those answers. Make you a better scientist is, is very refreshing to hear. And I think yeah. something that, uh, was was really nice to, to hear. I I, I just you. wanted to, to point that out. Yeah, I really like the book. Okay. If you can't <laughs> notice, um, <laughs> well, it was it is this was not supposed to be only about the book, but I'm glad that you talk about it. And <laughs> again, it's not uh, it's this is not sponsored by the book. The book is free for everyone. Well, if you want to buy it, yeah, buy it. But if you want a copy of the book, just just ask for it, and we'll send it to you. And if you want to make it better, please do. And if you want to sell it, please do. That's actually really cool as well. Like, uh, I, I love that approach. But yeah, it's actually really interesting. When I reached out to you, I didn't realize you wrote a book, um, which is great because <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, Microsoft. And um, I think we, we can actually transition to that. But yeah, yeah, I actually didn't know. And like this made this conversation like so much richer, I think, in a way. Like I was really excited about that as well. And just this is why you know, in essence, this perfect example of what I'm trying to do this is because, oh, there's this kind of thing that I'm interested in. And then that kind of uh, opens up and unfolds and you realize people have gone through a lot and they're thinking about a lot of things and, and discovering that people are, are thinking about a lot of things. So um, yeah, it's not about the book, but I think it was a, a great way to stumble um, upon it. <laughs> With that said, yes, let's, let's move on. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, your work at um, Microsoft. So could you tell me, yeah, could, could you just explain quickly what you do uh, at Microsoft and, and we'll go from there. At Microsoft, I'm the program director of the planetary computer, mm -hmm. which is um, a way to summarize it for this audience, which is technical, is an environmental, geospatial environmental analytics platform. Um, is the realization that while there has been a ton of progress in, in data science, in geospatial tools, in artificial intelligence, and in cloud computing, rarely 
someone knows about across all of these areas. So doing, doing a scalable geospatial AI is really hard for many reasons. Yet, a lot of the impact in environment, addressing the environmental challenges of today depend of getting better at exactly that. I would argue, maybe more or less AI, maybe more or less cloud computing, maybe more or less science, maybe more or less all of your spatial, but it's clear that, that it's holding the promise of all of these areas have delivered in their respective areas. So Microsoft has extremely high ambitions of 2030 for um, environmental sustainability, carbon negative, waste free, uh, water positive, and then there is the this is like the fourth bucket basically of our commitment, and it's on ecosystems, and is where the planetary computer is placed is on ecosystem, which is the realization that carbon is not in isolation, or water is not in isolation, or waste they're all interrelated. And the more we know, and the more science there is, the more it says that taking care of nature is not philanthropic. Taking care of nature is extremely critical for our well-being. There are many, many cases where, um, where we address uh, nature's problem or ecosystem's problem. It has benefits for the ecosystem itself, but also for us humans. Uh, for example, if you take care of 30% of the oceans or if you create fish banks, which you cannot fish, that leads to better uh, um, ecosystems and biodiversity in those places, obviously, because you cannot fish, but also the catchment of the overflow of fish around that protected place is more fish than if you didn't have bank, uh, mm -hmm. a, a space to start with. So there is, uh, and there is a ton of cases uh, under the labels of nature-based solutions or rewilding that or ecosystem services that we realize that one, we need to take care of nature so that nature takes care of us. And if we don't take care of nature, then it's bad for us. But when we do, we have benefits. So it's, it's, it's this realization that the challenges are growing, the opportunities are also growing. And one of the things that holds progress on solving on these outcomes, either on, on managing the, the risks and also the opportunities is a planetary computer which is this geospatial environmental uh, tool. So that's what we're working on. It's essentially a big pile of data, 25 petabytes of remote sensing. Uh, the usual suspects, Sentinel, Landsat, but much more. It's also an API. Um, it's a stack API, a spatiotemporal asset catalog. The planetary computer, for many reasons we can go into, is based on open source. Okay. And the stack API is also open source and it basically indexes everything on the data. So you don't need to sift through, if you want, you can do it. But if you don't want to sift through millions of files, you say, hey, just give me data for Wyoming in these sensors for this data with this level of cloud cover and then just returns that. And now we're going to implement that it returns it in a specific projection, for example, mm -hmm. or that it makes the median um, on the fly, all of these things, which which it's, will, will remove a lot of the complexities for the users of this data to, to do their work if we can do an API that, that abstracts right. out all of these things. And then a compute environment, which is basically Pangeo, which is an open source mm -hmm. collection of software, which is Python and Dask an XRI and all of those uh, wonderful open source things managed so that if you want to use the hub, you can do it with the Planetary Computer. If you want to deploy your Pangeo instance and consume the API or the data, you can do all that. So it's very modular in that approach. And then a collection of applications. So it's the data, the APIs, the computation, and the applications on top of that all so that you have the maximum, anyone has the maximum flexibility to work with the data they need in the way they need that, a full stack or just the APIs or whatever that you need. That's, that's basically the planetary computer, which is available today, planetarycomputer.microsoft.com. We're still on whitelisting accounts because mm -hmm. um, it's early. So what we don't want is, I don't know, like 20,000 users crossing our little server, we are a small team, so we are slowly opening it up. But if anyone has interest in using the planetary computer, please request an account and, and tell us how you use it. And then we'll, 
will approve the account. We plan to open for more accounts uh, by next year. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've been actually pretty um, lucky, I guess, to, to play around with it uh, while preparing for this. Um, the the one thing I, I kind of want to, and I feel like I have to ask out of the gate is like, when I heard about this the first time, this was like, oh, Microsoft is doing Google Earth Engine. <laughs> um, so what what's the difference there? And I'm guessing this has come up a few times. Um, and you have a much broader vision of, of what the planetary computer is. So yeah. is, is that accurate? Is it not? Um, if not, what are, what are some of the big differences that you, you mentioned that you see, sorry? It's, I wouldn't want to drive the conversation into a competitive of comparative discussion on what it is, what sure. is not. First of all, because um, Google Earth Engine was invented like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure if Google had to do it today, they would do it differently than they did it okay. 10 years ago. And it's a fantastic tool uh, with a ton of data and it has really helped. I genuinely believe it has really helped environmental sustainability a lot. And so kudos to them, fantastic product. It's also true that I believe um, all stakeholders in environmental sustainability should get access to these tools. So if they are not in the cloud, in in one cloud, it makes sense that all the other clouds have it too. And to some degree also Amazon has some of these tools. It is crucial to have these data sets. That's why it's available on all of the all of three major clouds. It's also crucial to have the tools to analyze this data. And that's why you have some degree in, in each cloud to do that. I believe that it makes the most strategic sense to do that in a modular open way. Right. And that's why we focused on using a standard language that we didn't invent, that's Jupyter Python. That's why we focused on open standards like the Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog. And that's why we allow you to do whatever you want to do with it. It's, um, it's modular. You want to consume the API? Great. You want to consume the whole thing with the, with the same experience that would be similar in, in, in Google Engine? Then great, do it. Mm. At the end of the day, what is clear is that the world needs better tools to manage environmental sustainability related data better. And it only stands to reason that all major players would want to make it as easy as possible for you to do that. So Microsoft decided to invest heavily on making this happen with a special focus. Obviously, it would be no surprise after speaking for like an hour and a half to maximize the being as close as possible to the science. Yeah, but also being as close as possible to the stakeholders that make uh, to have the the impact decisions like governments or corporations. The planetary computer is a science-based, uh, corporate-grade, open modular um, platform to do all of these things. Right. One of the things that I was thinking as well is why, like Microsoft is is this huge entity. Why is that? My, why is that why Microsoft wants to to build out of out of all the, the things there 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 is that Microsoft can can do? Why does building this planetary computer make sense uh, from from Microsoft's point of view? What what they can contribute to solving that problem? It's not the only thing we're also doing. So. Yeah. In the realm of environmental sustainability, there's a ton of the things we're doing. We have the Climate Innovation Fund, which is a billion dollars to invest mm-hmm. in companies doing that. We also have AI forest grants we also manage, which is, has been five years of giving uh, grants and credits to companies and scientists to advance in the way they do environmental science. We, all, we, have, a, we have a set of things. We have all of right. these companies yeah, yeah, yeah. on water, on waste. So in it we decided to do the planetary computer or um, Lucas Joppa, which is the chief environmental officer who then hired me to, to, <laughs> to, make, to then hire more people to do the planetary computer, decided to do that because of the realization that to actually drive the impact we need, we need something like a, a platform like that. And has been, I, I was digging up the other day and there is a talk he gave like almost 10 years ago where okay. he says, that, that he says, we need this thing. We need the thing we're building now, which is a platform to do environmental sustainability better. So now we have the opportunity to do it. Now we have data to do it. We have the tools to do that. And we have the unique possibility to combine mm. them in a coherent 
way so that anyone who needs that, and I would argue it's also part of our job. So everyone, everyone wants and can use these tools to do their environmental analytics. So it's part of the it's part of the strategy to, right. as you say, Microsoft is huge. It's a huge company. It's so huge that as we've said, or Lucas has said it many times, we have a responsibility to society itself. Okay. Because it's, uh, it's the, the valuation of these companies bigger than some countries. So we have a responsibility to be stewards of the societies we serve. And that's why the strategy of the planetary computer is so ambitious, but at the same time, so real. Mm -hmm. So, because we are very close to the scientists because we give grants to the scientists to do this work. And we're very close to the corporations and the enterprises who use our tools. So it seems that to me, this is an extremely unique position to then work it out so that any company who wants to use the latest paper on carbon stocks yeah. on how we can use that, then, oh, this is how you can do it. So this is like, as, as you mentioned, this is very um, new, at least publicly, like the, this is yeah. like in the making. What, what, is, what does the timeline look like? What do you think the, the, the success of the planetary computer would look like? If we were thinking, you know, a few years down the line, where, where do you think this would, where, where would you like it to be? I would like the world, or all the state, you remember we talk about the mapping of climate mm -hmm. change, same thing we could do with biodiversity collapse. And I would want every single one of the stakeholders on that challenge area that need data or APIs or computation or applications, I want to provide them with the tools they need in the planetary computer. So any asset owner, who has like a hotel, hotel chain to put an example in the coast, who wants to understand, hey, what is the impact of climate change in my properties? What could I do to protect that from the impact we have? Or how could I reduce the emissions from the providers of my towels or whatever thing it is? What questions do I have to, to analyze my environment, to do environmental analytics? I want to make it extremely easy for anyone who needs to do environmental analytics, which should be probably every single stakeholders in these areas, to do it with, um, to empower them to do it as easily, yeah. as easily as possible. Because that's the other thing. Right now, it's extremely high entry yeah. barrier. You need, to, you need to know a lot of things to even understand what you're doing. Hopefully, with these APIs and these applications, we are lowering that barrier so that even though the application is powered by the planetary computer, like a sticker in your computer that says powered by Intel or whatever, then you're consuming that thing. You're using the tools that were processed or accessed with planetary computer assets, but it's not about the planetary computer itself. It's about exposing the options that um, this, all of these stakeholders have to analyze the risks or analyze the opportunities. It's a huge also, we haven't talked about it much and no one talks so much, I don't know why, but there is massive opportunities, commercial opportunities around climate change. And it's totally fine to recognize those like natural yeah. solutions or eco, or, um, eco positive tourism. Um, I don't think it's the right, right, the right word, but you get my point. Or reducing all of your costs for things that you depend on that you can reduce and at the same time save environmental, save emissions. There's massive opportunities to, pro to do well by uh, doing good. Yeah, I think that's, that, that comes back to actually some of the successful examples that you talk about in, in the book earlier is that that cannot be done without uh, the, the proper incentives as well. So, yeah, I, 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 I get what you're um, yeah. getting to. Actually, this, this leads to when, when you go on the planetary computer website, there's like four elements to it. So I think we talked about the first three, but the last one is the, the applications, which seems to be the one where there's partnerships that are built between Microsoft and, and other companies. Um, we yeah. talked about development seed, for example, there's, there's a partnership uh, with them about an um, AI labeling tool. Um, I'd like mm -hmm. to ask about what, what are those partnerships and, and how do they, how do they come up? What, what is, yeah, what is the nature of, of those partnerships and how did they kind of arise? At the end of the day, the planet computer will be successful, I believe, or the fastest path to the biggest impact is to be a platform. Um, so that means applications built on top of that. Um, of course, some, some people would need heavy use of the hubs and the computation thing, but 
probably the entry point or the thing people will use or the stakeholders will use that the most is these applications. So basically they come that two ways. One is that we identify that this is something that is extremely important and we reach out to that partner and then we work with them to create an application out of that. That is the case for most of these or the opposite happens. Uh, partners say, hey, this would be really impactful for X, Y, Z reasons and the scale we need, we need to do it with the planetary computer. So let's work together to build those applications. So that's, especially now that we are creating the platform, it's a much more hand-holding approach, but hopefully as this grows, the, the realm of applications increases. For example, the one that you mentioned on the uh, land cover mapping that we are developing. Um, but also there's another one that I, I love, which is the conservation planning. And basically this conservation planning is, imagine you know how many plants and what kind of plants and how many animals and what kind of animals you have in an area, in a given area, a valley or your park or whatever. And you have a limited budget to do conservation or restoration. And then you know, hey, what can I do? What is the planning that would make the most impact with my limited budget? That's a mathematical question. It's, a, it's minimizing the cost given a lot of variables. It's a um, hyper parameter optimization problem. Mm -hmm. That is Markham. Markham is a thing that exists for many years, actually, I think a couple of decades. It's an open source tool. And we realized that doing conservation planning is extremely important for the challenges of climate change and biodiversity mm -hmm. collapse. So we reach out to them and say, hey, we want to invest in making Markson, which is open source, still open source, and we want to make sure that it runs on the planetary computer. So right. we talk with them and we talk with the Nature Conservancy, which is the, the company that the, the organization that is now stewarding the ecosystem of Markson to make sure it runs. Same thing we are doing with ecosystem monitoring and the uh, partners with com com conservation science partners with Carbon Plan and a few others that are coming up or like Impact Observatory or others. Right, okay. And so did, did you see any other um, applications kind of starting oh, yeah. out? There, we have more that are uh, in the making and we'll, we'll put as soon as they are, but okay. oh yeah, I, I would love, I would love the applications page to, to have an infinite scroll of, <laughs> um, <laughs> of if, look, so the planetary computer comes from the experience of what I mentioned before, AI yeah. for Earth. If you go to AI for Earth, Microsoft, and you go to partners, you see a long list of, of things we've done with universities and companies. Those things we've done, if we had to do them today, we would figure out how they could use the planetary computer right. because we are building the planetary computer yeah. because they didn't, these partners did not have these yeah. resources. So they had to build it from scratch. Just like the story of development seed and Mapbox, we realized that every single time anyone works on environmental sustainability, they have the same problems. How do we get Sentinel data? How do we filter out the yeah. metadata of single data? How do we put it in a computer environment? How do we do clusters? Uh, so how do we spin up a cluster that works with all of that? That's why we chose to build the planetary computer. So that list of partners of the AI for Earth, or even the papers, we have like tons of papers done uh, with grants from AI for Earth. I wish that in mm -hmm. three, uh, three years from now, two years from now, there's also a very long list of papers that have been done with the planetary right. computer assets. Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll have to see in a couple of years where, where that comes out. This is very exciting. Uh, I, I think lowering the barrier to entry is, this is the best thing that we can do right now is like giving people the tools how to do that, but also making sure that you don't need to be like a geospatial data en engineer or data scientist to ever see what a Sentinel-2 tile looks like. Exactly. I think um, we can end it here. As um, you probably know, I like to ask the same question um, at the end, which is just wanting to know if, if there's any um, media, books, podcasts that, that you would recommend? I think this is a little bit of a uh, biased question here because of course there's yours, but outside of that, is, is there anything that you've read that you think <laughs> is worth uh, kind of sharing or, or, or listen to um, that, that, that comes to mind? I lately I've been unable to, to read much with the- Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> with the baby, but I always recommend the short history about nearly everything uh, from Bill, Bill Bryson. It's an absolutely amazing 
book for anyone who has a curious mind. Uh, it's, it's, it's so good. I also love Mars, but now after the movie, everyone has read, has seen the movie Mars. The book is really good because you know one of the Andy Andy Weir. Even oh, the, the Martian. Story of, right, yeah. Yeah, the Martian. Uh, sorry, Mars, the Martian. Um, even the story how the book came about, it's a it's a cool story. But to me, the, the good thing of the Martian, and I I got recommended that book by the Minister of Education in Argentina, who wow. said you would love this book. Because if you think about the book, it's a relentless struggle to use science mm -hmm. to solve problems. Um and I love that vision, and and that's a book I recommend a lot. Uh, there's there's a ton more that I would recommend. I don't want to make this very long, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if people want to know more. You go to Goodreads and and my profile page, and there's a ton of for sure. Books yeah, I'll, I'll actually, love. I don't do that, but I should do that. Oh, should, there's there's they... another one, um, Humankind, which yes. is a very needed story of how hum the, the goodness, the innate goodness in, in in humans is something that we desperately need to reinforce the message. So. Uh, I would start with hum um, humankind and also uh, factfulness from Hans Rosling, um, amazing person who died recently and, and he wrote an amazing book of, of that. And yeah. Um, this I could go on and on, but those have some <laughs> no. But of this the is this I is use. great. I'll link to to um, to Goodreads. This is actually a really good idea that I'll I'll start doing. Um, so Bruno, thank you very much for uh, spending some time with me and going over. Um, your life and, and the things that you're doing. Um, very thankful uh, for this conversation. Thank you, Maxime. When you told me that you wanted to speak for an hour and a half or two hours, I was a bit scared. If if I would <laughs> have things to say, clearly I can speak for hours and hours. So thank you for doing this and whoever made it this far, thank you. <laughs>